This is Plate Mark with me, Ann Schaefer. I'm an independent curator and I focus on works on paper, prints, drawings, photographs, and books. Plate Mark is a podcast about one quarter of that group, prints, and the printmaking ecosystem. And when I say prints, I'm talking about fine art prints, usually limited editions, though not always. And we're talking about etchings, woodcuts, lithographs, screen prints, that kind of thing. I'm trying to support the print ecosystem by introducing you, the listener, to people who occupy various roles in the ecosystem. And that can include artists, of course, but also includes printers, publishers, gallery people, museum curators, art historians, authors, and today, one who covers both things, an artist and curator. It's my hope with this series to help people understand a little bit better what all these people do in these various roles. We're gonna share with you stories that include and hopefully make more understandable some of the challenging technical bits of printmaking. I love this corner of the art world because I believe it is full of the nicest people you'll ever meet. And it is charming over here. I like the genuine, you know this, and I want genuine people helping genuine artists make genuine things. And that's why I'm here and why I'm sharing all of these stories with you, helping you better understand why prints are special and worthy of your attention. The other reason, of course, is that they are a terrific gateway to collecting because they are always less expensive than singular and unique works of art. Today, my guest is Amy Worthen, Amy is an artist. She primarily engraves. You know I'm a sucker for engraving. But she also is a a career-long curator. She has wonderful stories for us. She specializes on the curatorial end in mannerist prints. That's our favorite Holtzius and friends. But she also is a engraver, obviously, contemporary engraver, because she's still working at it. But she has done remarkable things out there at the Des Moines Art Center. Amongst many shows, she also helped establish the Des Moines Art Center's print club. And that's a big deal. If you don't know, there are print clubs all over the country and they were really big and popular for a long time. I think that they're probably waning, but one that's still very, very vibrant is out in Des Moines. The other cool thing about Amy is that she lives half of the year in Venice, in Italy not Venice, California, and she wraps her experiences in Venice into her art. She's a a deep thinker and I think a super creative person, and I think also you will enjoy her. So, housekeeping. I identify as a cishet white woman and I use the pronouns she, her. I record plate mark in Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway Conway people. Any images Amy and I talk about will be over in the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. And over there, there's a bunch of other things you can do. You can join our Facebook group. You can leave a comment for me. Click that little microphone. You can support the podcast financially by becoming a monthly subscriber. I think that's it. Let's get rolling. Amy, it is wonderful to see you. Thank you for coming on Plate Mark today. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for entering my world and my entering your world. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. That's right. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself for everybody before we get too far? Sure. I'm Amy Namowitz Worthen, and I am both a engraver and printer and a longtime curator of prints and drawings. And a scholar, also art historian, don't forget. Oh, yes. An art historian. I almost an art detective. I think an engraving detective. We can talk oh. about that. Yes. Oh, you know, I love engraving. Right. <laughs> it's like you're a printmaking triple threat. You know, you come from all sides, the history, the making and the current day contemporary art, you know, curatorial mm-hmm. stuff. It's great. It's my life. <laughs> Yeah, right. Tell us about how you how you figured all of this all out, that you were an artist and that when did prints come into your life? From a very early age. Uh, my mother was an artist and she had done a lot of lithography. And so I grew up with my mother's lithographs hanging on the wall. She had gone to um, under college and then Columbia and the Art Students League. And so I knew about prints for a really long time. And then I went to the High School of Music and Art in New York, and we had a printmaking class. There was a postcard on the bulletin board of the 
studio that had a uh, announcement. It was a show announcement for a exhibition by Leonard Baskin. And a man of peace was the image. And I thought to myself, I would like to study with this person. And so when I applied to colleges, I found out that, um, well, I applied to a number of schools that had excellent academics, but also good art and art history programs. And um, I was accepted at Smith College. So I went and uh, they exempted me from the freshman, you know, the first year courses, because I'd already had a lot of art and art history in New York. And so I was able from my first year to work with Baskin, who really took me under his wing. He emphasized to me that it was important to not just be a good artist, but also to learn about the world, to be a serious scholar. And um, he introduced me to his own collection, his uh, his books. His, he really opened a world to me. The spring before my freshman year, summer. He asked what I wanted to do that summer. And I said, well, I want to go back to New York. That's where I was from. And I'd like to work in a museum. And so he said, come with me. And he went up to the art department office and he put in a call to Bill Lieberman, who was at that time the curator of prints and illustrated books at the Museum of Modern Art. And he said, Bill, I have this student I want you to take on for the summer. And I went to New York, I had an interview, they hired me as, of course, an unpaid intern, but I had, from age 19, I was already having print room experience. And this was the time when, like, Tatiana Grossman was bringing in some of the first prints from ULAE, and Reva Castleman was just a young curatorial assistant. It was just an amazing world. We had an art theft that summer. Something was stolen out of the galleries. It was so foundational to have those experiences. What got stolen? Oh, my God. It was a Jules Passant notebook, a sketchbook notebook. that was on view. So one of my jobs was every morning before the museum opened, I was sent with a spray bottle of um, Plexi cleaner to go in and get fingerprints off of all the frames. And so at some point, somebody had come in the gallery. And at that time, there were no security measures. This was in a, a, a case in a vitrine. And somebody had come in and pried open the case, which just had the Plexi sitting on top of it. And took up this Jules Passant notebook. So um, then we had a, a ransom note. We had the FBI. We had, uh, yeah, it's a great story. I, I actually, it, Bill Lieberman was supposed to go meet somebody at Grand Central Station at the lockers and wear a red carnation. And actually the FBI impersonated him and, um, this is all part of my oral history. <laughs> it's great. Story. So, so I knew that the print, you know, print and drawings world was not just things in drawers and on the walls, but there was quite a life around them. But like, of all things, to try and steal a past past a well, sketchbook. I mean, honestly. Well, so I mean, I can go on about this. The um, it was a very particular theft. Clearly, it was somebody who was in the art world or related to to have known that this would be a significant thing. And they did catch the thief. They arrested him at this meeting, you know, by the lockers. And, and he was the son of a rather well-known American sculptor of bronze monuments. And uh, I don't know what ever happened to him. But um, anyway, it was it was resolved. They got the piece back. And end of story as far as I know. That's a really quick resolution to it because, you know, yeah. usually it's years later, somebody might come up with something because someone's trying to sell something, you know, it's never mm -hmm. that fast. That's amazing. Yeah, he must have really needed money. I also remember that uh, this is when uh, the, <laughs> the prior renovation, so we're talking about in the 1960s, and the print department at that point had windows on 53rd Street. And 
the day of this meetup, we couldn't be near the windows. We all had to be away in the back in case there were any people watching across the street. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Jesus. (laughs) Take cover. (laughs) Yeah. I don't think that anything was ever stolen when I was working in a particular museum, but Mm -hmm. there were definitely several thefts from the BMA in the history of it that Jay could, Jay Fisher could talk about. One was somebody, well, I probably shouldn't suggest to somebody how to do it, but, you know, bringing in copies on old paper and switching them out in the mats or the folders as they were, you know, visiting the study room. Yeah. Right. And he was a well-known, you know, scholar dealer person who shall remain nameless. <laughs> exactly. I can't remember his name. That's really the yeah. problem. <laughs> no, but apart from these external things, I mean, I've also used my abilities as an engraver to really understand and resolve some mysteries about what's actually going on in prints in history. Okay, so let's do it. I should. Okay, so let me back up a little. So when I was still at Smith. I finally took etching at a Yale summer school program. And then I liked that. And uh, Baskin said, where do you want to go to graduate school? And and he said, well, the only place to go to graduate school at that point was the University of Iowa. That was the place. And so New York child that I was, I was a little bit doubtful about that, but it's like, okay, you know, so I'll go to Iowa for a year or something. I'll see how, how it is. And Mauricio Lazansky was the head of the uh, printmaking for the graduate students. It turns out he only offered intaglio. He did not offer lithography. Would cut. I didn't know that when I went out there. You could I only didn't know study that intaglio. Yeah, which was kind of a oh, shock. Wow. It was, but we all had to learn to engrave. And he said that was absolutely central. Lysansky himself had had worked with Hayter in New York. And so in that sense, I'm a kind of grandchild of of Hayter. But I couldn't, I couldn't get it. It's like, I I just couldn't do it. I really struggled. And finally, a fellow graduate student, a woman named Patricia Wynn, helped me to engrave. And then it became so easy when I really understood what you needed to do about posture and you know, and um, way to hold the tool, and that it really became the way that best expressed the way I, I drew. So eventually yeah. in life, I became just a pure engraver, though I did other media along the way. But I found that hater style engraving was very performative. It was very macho, really. Uh, You could see people make these great, expressive, deep lines. And I really like the the finer lines. And so I eventually, I, I mean, each engraver really has their own signature. You cannot say, you know, that there's one look to engraving at all. Engraving became my medium, both because by this time I was good at it, and we're talking about, say, the late 70s now, but also because I realized I didn't have to. I could love Goltzius. I could love Milan I, without imitating them. I could be me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. And in the mid-80s, we were living in London, and I started, I had some opportunities to show with the Royal Society of Painter Etchers and Engravers there. At the same time, I had enrolled in a school for silversmiths and goldsmiths in engraving to learn the techniques of lettering engraving and ended up writing an article, which is on the calligraphic inscriptions in Dutch Mannerist prints. At the same time that I was learning engraving from the last letter engravers in the silversmith goldsmith trade in London. So I was gaining skills that were really interesting. I'd go, like at the beginning of the class, I remember bringing some work in to show the students. And the other students were going to be taking guild exams. They were going to qualify to become engravers, silversmith engravers. And they would look at my pictorial engravings and they'd say, oh, those are really nice. Did you design them yourself? Because... These master engravers of lettering and decoration just copied 
So it was so interesting to um, to see this other world. But nevertheless, having acquired some of those skills, I was then able to look at, especially Mannerist engraving, which I loved so much, with a very particular eye of knowing exactly what was going on. There are a couple of artists that I watch on Instagram who incorporate that kind of lettering in their engravings. I just love watching them. Like, how do you, I mean, I think they're just teaching themselves or reading your article, you know, like it's, I don't know where you go and learn that stuff unless you really are at Emporia or in London somewhere, you know? Right. You know, it was interesting that class, particular class had people from around the world. There was somebody who had been sent by, I think it was Bank of Iran or something, to learn, you know, for banknote engraving. And I remember that there was a young woman from Texas whose father was a, a gun, you know, an arms engraver. The center for the Gravure des Armes, the engraving of arms, was Saint Etienne, France. And uh, for centuries, that was where, and this is engraving on steel. Saint-Étienne happens to be the French sister city of Des Moines, where I live. I had a solo exhibition at the École des Beaux-Arts, and I got to spend you know, a day, of course, doing demonstrations of engraving, but also to spend a day in the gun engraving department to see how they do it. And, and it's done with hammers and the burins are twisted backwards. And it's just amazing. One of our early guests on the podcast, James Ellers, yeah. was is, well, he just moved to Baylor University, but he was at Emporia in Kansas. And he was, he said that half of his students were from the gunsmith jewelry hmm. and, and half yeah. of them were, you know, on paper people. And that his first semester, they would only do the carving because the printing wasn't really necessary for the guys who mm-hmm. were doing the the guns, but also this idea of, of engraving on something that's curved or, you know, right. Ugh, it just sounds so yeah, So the burins have to be fabricated to get inside rings and so forth. One of the really nice things that has happened to me in my life is that as old engravers in the jewelry world have gone out of business. I have been given lots and lots of historic burins. So I ha- probably have well over a hundred, which I'm trying to figure out what to do with because um, it's like a little museum. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Huh. I think about that yeah. one. So my master's thesis at Iowa <laughs> was on the multiple line graver. Oh, right. And I wanted to ask you about multi-gravers. that. Multi-gravers, yeah. And so at that time, so we're talking about 1968, 69, something like this. In the Bronx, which is where I was from, they still, the Muller company, the engraving company, was, R.C. Muller was in the Bronx. And so I went and saw how they machine multiple line gravers which was interesting. And then I think I tried doing some intaglio prints using them, though it was primarily a wood engraving tool. Oh, is that right? They're multiple line engravers for copper though, right? Well, you can use them for copper, but there's huge amounts of resistance because basically it's not that diamond, that lozenge shape point, you know, that the burin enters the copper, there's huge resistance. And so what is kind of nice is you can walk the tool and you can get charcoal-y looking lines that are engraved. Oh. I, so oh, interesting. I think those were part of my thesis project back then. But oh, anyway, wow. I've had a, a kind of hands-on interest in in the tools and in the, in the actual training of engravers. Just about a year and a half ago, I participated in a conference in Paris that was, it was called uh, Graver la Danse, and it was the project at the National Institute for Art History in Paris, where they're studying choreography and, and so forth. And I gave a talk on the training of Buren engravers in the specialty areas of uh, choreographic notation, music geography and uh, calligraphy and the training of the engravers in the 17th and 18th century to do 
those tasks. So that's that's going to be an exhibition that's going to publish soon. Oh, that's cool. Where are you finding all this? I mean, you must, obviously, you have a pretty fantastic library behind you, but like, where do you mm -hmm. find information on music engravers from the 17th century? Do you know that there is, well, I mean, it's France, so, you know, everything is documented. Well, true. <laughs> but, you know, but at that point, people were starting to write manuals. It used to be just passed along within the workshop, but you know, starting even before Abraham Voss, um, you get these manuals. We all know the illustrations from them, but read the texts and they're all opinionated. And they, anyway, by the time you get to the Encyclopédie in the uh, middle, you know, through the later 18th century, you have experts who are writing and revealing these secrets and they're is terrific information about this and stuff like, oh, they didn't teach me that in graduate school, <laughs> but the, the French knew that. And so there are um, essays on mezzotint and music engraving, script. You know, that's kind of the, the end of it. And then you have women engravers who are writing some of those articles too. Oh, nice. Yes. All right, generally, as we might imagine from families of engravers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and women really dominated music engraving in 18th century. Oh, art. interesting. Many music engravers, and again, special tools, punches, and so forth. But if, so, in the music engraving, we're not just talking about the cover art for a nice song. We're talking about the entire score, right? Because this was before lithography, and so the only way that you could reproduce would be through woodcut or in, if you're intaglio. Oh. Jesus. They couldn't. They couldn't just write it. <laughs> Lithography changed everything for music. You you are all over the place, Amy Worthen. <laughs> <laughs> you you're like a polymath. I swear to God, it's like when you read the list of the various things you've written over time. I'm like, oh my God, ding ding ding. <laughs> it's amazing, and I feel like you kind of led this blessed life. So tell everybody, you know, where where you live now, half the time. <laughs> okay, well, I um, I live in Venice in Italy, but I still have a house in Des Moines. I'm in Des Moines right now, and about oh, 1989, I was invited to be a visiting artist, a guest artist at the Scuola Internazionale di Grafica, which is a printmaking school in Venice. And I'd been to Venice many times before, but just passing through no particular connection with the artist or art community. And I kept getting invited back and I really thought, oh God, I would love to live here and was really connected with the printmaker community there at that point. And when my husband, whose field was art history, Tom Morven, was Italian, he was Italian Renaissance specialist, but I convinced him to take his sabbatical of 93, 94 in Venice instead of in the return to Florence. And um, he did. And so then because of his actually breakthrough research in the area of Tintoretto, we both became really attracted to it. So we kept going back and we rented and by the year 2000, we were ready to buy our own place. And um, so we bought an apartment in a completely wrecked building, which took a couple of years to restore, but moved in in 2004. Um, I fortunately was allowed to be an early remote worker because I was a curator at the Des Moines Art Center. So they said, we know you get your work done. So just figure out your own schedule. So I was kind of commuting back and forth every two months. I got permanent residence in 2004. So now I have no restrictions. And so basically it's 20 years that we've owned this apartment there. And both in terms of my own artwork and my research and where it's positioned for travel. It's, it's just been great. <laughs> so some of yeah. us I'm sure are green with envy at this moment. <laughs> I find Venice, I mean, I've only been to Venice once, but I was like, this is unbelievable. I couldn't get over the light and the water. Oh, so beautiful. Yeah. And as I say, more people 
come to Venice and come to Des Moines, you know, as far as visitors. <laughs> a lot of people. I wonder why. <laughs> Nothing against Des Moines. You know, there's, there's, you know, all the, the extraordinary history and art and just the human scale of Venice, but uh, also the liveliness of it being a major center for contemporary art, you know, with Biennale and the architecture of Biennale and conference center and music and opera. It's like all the um, advantages of living in, a, you know, a great city or great university town, but we're only currently 49,000 residents and that right? about a couple hundred thousand tourists a day. <laughs> Yeah, right. Oh, boy. I can understand why you'd come home in the summertime, because Des Moines must be lovely in the summer. It's verdant. It's really beautiful here right now. Yeah. 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 So how did you manage to get your curator job at the Des Moines Art Center? Like, that's a plum job, which you held for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, the director of the Des Moines Art Center when we moved there was Jim Demetrian. And he came in 1969, left in 1984. And he saw that I was, I mean, I was recently out of graduate school, but he saw that I was interested in history prints. So he started giving me these guest gigs of, you know, putting up an exhibition. And then one day a book arrived in the library, which was a catalog raisonné of Jacques Belanche's etchings, the etchings of Jacques Belanche. And he said, Oh, you should do a Belon show for us. Uh, for those who are <laughs> not, <laughs> who don't know, Jacques Belon was a, a early 17th century uh, French court artist at Nancy in Lorraine. And he was an extraordinary mannerist painter who not many paintings have survived, but uh, 60 to 80 of his etchings has survived that are some of the great extraordinary prints and rarities. So I looked at Jim when he said, oh, you should do a Belon show for us. And I said, you're crazy or like impossible. And I just <laughs> blew it off. And then he asked again. And I said, well, we cannot possibly do this without the uh, collaboration of the Bo Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, because they have <laughs> the greatest collection, you know, certainly in this country. And so I was sent off to talk to Sue Welshreed and Eleanor Sayre, and they agreed. Des Moines would organize the show, and we coordinate all the loans from everywhere, and Boston would do the catalog. And, and so Sue and I became great friends and collaborators through Belange. Anyway, so there were a number of things like that where temporary assignments grew into like major, really significant projects. Uh, the Des Moines Art Center also organized the first retrospective of Giorgio Morandi in the early 80s. It opened at the Guggenheim. It was at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and then it was uh, at Des Moines. And I wrote the uh, this essay on Morandi's etchings and negotiated the loans from the Uffizi of Morandi's own collection of his prints and so forth. So I had some just major opportunities through Jim Demetrian. He was somebody who saw possibilities in people and really gave them, uh, you know, gave me and, and there were a couple of other people like that, you know, the opportunity to grow in an amazing way. And he asked if I wanted to become, you know, a permanent curator. And at that point, I was so much focused on my work that I was still happy to do that and do projects for other museums as well. But it was actually not until, we're talking about 1997 that I accepted a, well, I mean, Jim was long gone. You know, we had a different director, but a, a regular curatorial position, which I held for about 20 years. But wow. I was determined not to be one or the other. I mean, life is not just binaries. And I you know there are other people who were sending projects my way. For example, uh, Suzanne Borsch, who was the, you know, first at the Metropolitan Museum and then the curator of Prince at Yale. When they were writing the Dictionary of Art, that 34 volume enormous thing, she recommended that I write the history and techniques of engraving for the Dictionary of Art. 
And this was another opportunity that I had to do both because I have never liked the diagrams that you see in Hind, that you see in the Encyclopédie of the Buren, you know, the dry point needles, those tools that you see represented over and over again. Um, they don't give enough information. And so mm -hmm. I said, I will write this massive article, but I want to do my own illustration for it. And so they let me engrave the, the plate of engraving tools that's in the Dictionary of Art. And so having this freedom to bring this kind of hands-on experience to the art history has manifested in, in many, many interesting ways. You know, if you have, there's sometimes, they're just really wonderful people that are kind of a blessing in your life that see that there's something in you that you might not even see yourself, that they discover this capacity and, and push you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, that's very true. I, I've talked to a variety of curators through these interviews and the number of them who have, you know, made it to some really amazing role in the ecosystem had incredible mentors early on and mm -hmm. experiences. And, you know, I, I, some of us were limited by the the budgets of the museums we were at, like Baltimore could never produce catalogs for things on a regular basis. It would only be for the big, you know, flashy contemporary or painting shows or whatever. Again, I still have never gotten a catalog published, <laughs> even though, you know, it was should have, could have, should have, but it was just, you know, not something yeah. that the museum was able to do. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think I'm really proud of having done it, the Des Moines Arts Center was teaching is, you know, we would all do these history of prints classes or, and um, I had a student who took the class three times and he was a patent engineer with the Maytag Corporation, Newton, Iowa. So he was driving there and wow. he, and I said, I think you need to look into starting a print club here. I said, get in touch with the Cleveland uh, print club, the Cleveland Museum of Art. And uh, so he did some research, and in 1981, the Des Moines Art Center Print Club was founded, and it's still going strong until COVID meetings every month. Now, they're, you know, everything got re reprogrammed after that. There were cutbacks in the amount of time that one could meet. We had you know, the gifts, the annual gifts, I think they've given now. 80 or 90 works to the permanent collection. There's a, com a community of print collectors, print enthusiasts, people who are just interested in prints. I've built a family for prints. Uh, so your ecosystem is, is such a great word. It's just been amazing to see now a couple of generations of uh, people who have moved through, you know, have been leaders and print club. And Yeah, the Baltimore Museum has a, a print drawing and photograph society, mm -hmm. which is a little different than a club. Like there's no, they don't publish a work every year for each of the members, you know, nothing like that, but it's more programming mm -hmm. and support for the department at the museum. And Jay, for instance, Jay Fisher, who died this last mm -hmm. uh, winter, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, for 45 years was building people's interest and in knowledge and collecting in Baltimore. And there's, there's a lot of collecting here and it's all because of the museum and it's for Prince, it's, I think it's a crucial, that's a crucial part of the ecosystem is, is helping people understand because it's a little intimidating and technically a little mm -hmm. difficult to understand if you don't know, but yeah, critical, critical role. Well, you, you also were able to do the print fairs. We had itinerant dealers come through, which was a way of building collection, but then people here travel a lot. So right. they... Well, how, when you got, when you started working with Jim at the Des Moines Art Center, how expansive was the print collection? It was small. It was really small. They had collected prints. I mean, the, okay. The Des Moines Art Center was the first museum to open after World War II, our first art museum. So it opened in 1948. So it doesn't have the history of those long metropolitan civic collections. Uh, there were some private collections, but I mean, we're talking about a handful of thousand works. Um, and Jim had actually early in his career in graduate school had worked as a curator at the old Tamarind in LA. 
And so oh he had this, yeah, so he was interested and supportive of Prince. I mean, his field ah. was Egon Schiele and, I mean, the secession and so forth. But he he decided that he really needed to upgrade the collection and to start making important acquisitions. And so, and, you know, it was asking my opinion because my husband and I were also collecting prints. So he started buying from people like David Tunick and who again was kind of a young dealer back then, but making some really fantastic acquisitions. And so the collection never got to be gigantic and encyclopedic, but the idea across the board was to acquire things of exceptional quality. Jim became the director of the Hirshhorn, you know, and then had a whole other career in, in D.C. But uh, I was able to keep that focus on getting really good things. So I I had also supporters who, there, there was money. There was money, let's put it that way. There were funds for making some great print acquisitions. So it still is in numerically not very big, but... I'm proud of what's in it. Oh, I bet. Is there one work that you brought in that you would like to have at home too? (laughs) (laughs) You probably have some. (laughs) Well, one thing I'm just really thrilled I was able to get was a Jean Duvet engraving from the Apocalypse series. I was able to buy uh, an impression of uh, Van Gogh's Dr. Gachet. Oh. Now that seemed to be, that would be amazing to have. Nice. And was able to get a, a very beautiful Martin Schoengauer engraving, Coronation of the Virgin. I, I could happily live with that one, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. No, it was, even though the museum is known primarily as a modern contemporary art museum, it prints cover all periods. And, when you were teaching history of prints, was that a that was a program through the collecting club, or was it no? In, actually, a through the education department. There's a studio education, you know, studio and oh. art history education wing there too. And you you would pull out some things from the collection and then illustrate it otherwise. Right. Yeah. Actually, at one one of the classes I did was a history and techniques, and so they'd have a. I, I think probably we did the studio second because our hands. but within the same day we would look at oh, wow. historic woodcuts but then we you know they'd also have an experience of relief printmaking so it was immediate it wasn't at different times in the semester that's a nice way to do it like here here's some great things here go try it <laughs> <laughs> so you print your own work you mm-hmm. made a lot of it i must say mm-hmm. i have a great big American French tool press in yeah. my basement, you know, and it's just 36 by 60 inch bed. I do my engraving both in Des Moines and then also in Venice. I often end up making drawings in Des Moines and then engraving them in Venice and then vice versa. Huh. Um, in Venice, though, uh, although I can print, I do my proofing at the uh, Scuola di Grafica, but I have an edition printer I work with there. His name is Roberto Mazzetto. And he has his studio, it's called the Stamperia del Tintoretto. It's in the house where Tintoretto lived. And um, wow. he also fabricates folders. There's this whole beautiful uh, tradition of presentation of prints, edition prints in Venice. You get uh, folder, your inner folder, there could be text. And uh, the, his workshop can do that entire process. Yeah, it's it's a, a great resource. And then he'll put his blind stamp on it if if he's done the additions. And I haven't, I, I get commissions rather frequently. So it's a great way of producing additions that look really nice to be used in the way they're used. So commissions from who, for instance? Well, I've had commissions from both state universities, their art museums, from the Des Moines Opera, from a couple of churches, from a print club in Italy. But this is really pretty cool. The Iowa Economic Development Authority has decided to use my works 
as official gifts from the state of Iowa. And so when there are international delegations that go abroad, these prints of my work, and it says, it, uh, the, the call fun of one of them says, uh, in our mission of promoting the state of Iowa, here's this commission print by engraver Amy Moore then. So I have a spreadsheet where, you know, I've seen all over the world where my prints have been given. But a uh, former governor of Iowa became the U.S. ambassador to China. He asked to have my prints in the embassy. So I had uh, a number of things. And it's kind of funny, too, because I, I mean, you've seen my work. It has uh, a, a lot of architectural uh, images, but there's always or frequently fantasy that's taking place in them. And so it was actually some fantasized imagery that you could read in a lot of different ways. And I thought, well, this is charming that they've taken this as the official art for our embassy in China. Has anybody said this is this doesn't uh, confer with our you know thinking in China or anything? Like there's no pushback <laughs> no, on fantasy. Not, no, is no, there? He was he was promoting <laughs> Iowa artists. So there we go. Well, this is oh, this is great. an interesting thing because yes, I've I've spent a lot of my life in Iowa. I still think of myself as a kid from the Bronx, <laughs> you know, from New York, from New Yorker. But um, anyway, so I my work is used to represent Iowa, which is lovely. And Iowa is definitely, I mean, it's a print state. It really is. And so many people have come through here. Oh, for sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think, I'm, I'm sure I have mentioned Iowa and it's like the university our printmaking department and its legacy to connect it back through Lazansky to Hader. Mm-hmm. And also I have to say, you're not the first person to say that Lazansky was sort of a, a disappointment in terms of, I don't know what you experienced, but somebody said and it was late in his career said he never would he didn't even talk to you in your first year because you weren't deemed important or something so I was like what <laughs> well I, I mean I can tell you some stories which I this is not the first time I've I've told them is that when I was a student of Leonard Baskins I was what my husband later called the Baskinettes you know so people who <laughs> you know your, your work looked like Leonard Baskins you know it's you, but by the time I got to graduate school, I was done channeling or imitating the master's work. And I wanted to do my own things. But the people who were successful of my graduate student cohort were the people who were making work that looked a lot more. They really looked like Iowa prints, and mine ah. never did. And he, this is, this is, how far back he took my arm one time and he started stroking it and he he said you don't understand the etching at all he said you have to make love to the copper what yes yes oh amy i know and so that wasn't good right (laughs) that wasn't (laughs) so years later when i was starting to have some success uh we ran into each other and he was taking some credit for what I was doing. And I said, well, what happened? I said, well, why, why didn't we get along? And he said, well, we were two prima donnas. Well, I don't know that it was a prima donna, but so then there was just this detente, but I honestly was ready to move on before I even got there practically. I think a lot of people that I went to school with never made prints again. So it was quite a, a burnout situation. Oh, no. Or then there were people who went to Iowa and then kind of hid it. I bet you don't know that Reva Castleman went to Iowa. I did not know that. No. And wow. you know how she was, uh, of course, not a printmaker after that, but she, her interest in prints became so international and cutting edge and circling way back to your first question about what were some of the things that drew me into printmaking though when I was in college there was a film that was projected at one of you know we went up to lecture hall to see a film and it showed Hader engraving and 
Mm-hmm. It had the camera right down by the. I've oh, I was so entranced by that film. It's like I, I couldn't believe it. I've never located that film again. If you know, oh. I would love to have that information because it was magical. Was he narrating? Maybe, maybe. maybe. I mean, yeah, that one is out online. He's he's engraving angels wrestling. And it's the one where he drops the plate into the acid and says, how long to let it sit? Lights a cigarette. Long enough for a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the main thing was seeing the the Buren and the copper curl. Yeah, I would love that information from you. But one time a Des Moines TV station did a, about a five-minute interview with me. They had to serve... A, series called In the Artist's Studio. And the cameraman was there. And I just said, get closer, 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 because I was remembering how amazing it was to see that. And so that is in this video that uh, you can see me doing that same thing, but I was inspired by... uh, (laughs) You never met Hater? No, I did not. I could have gone to Paris and met him, but I never did. No. Mm -mm. But when you say the way he carved was macho, like, you know, we all think Mm -hmm. it, but I don't think anyone's ever said that word out loud. (laughs) (laughs) But when you see pictures of him in the studio and stuff, his forearms are like Popeyes, I swear to God. And I mean, he, I think when you were talking about how somebody helped you kind of make that transition into it being more easy for you, I think engraving was like, butter for him somehow Mm -hmm. and he felt like he could do all of that automatic whatever which nobody else seems to be able to do Mm -hmm. so you know I I just yeah no I I've gotten to that point as well but uh, a number of years ago Catherine Brown brought me into Crown Point Press to teach her engravers to engrave because they could do all the wonderful aquatins and all the entire things, but they didn't know how to engrave. So the chapter, there's a chapter in the book, Magical Secrets of Line Itching and Engraving, that features me showing Catherine Brooks, who is the author of that book, how to sit, you know, how to sharpen the tools, the posture. And I've noticed uh, some of the videos online now of Edwin had to engrave people are sitting forward but i always sit parallel to the table with my feet mm. and it's really important and the, this whole thing of balance and uh, and if you've got it right it's it's really easy i'll say it's like ice skating and you don't ice skate on the tips of your ice skates you just kind of glide and you just lift the yeah burin enough so it engages i think people probably don't think that they can make that shallow a mark or something and have it work but it does you'd think printers would train but most most of them might have a day of engraving in graduate school but yeah. didn't really learn but um a number of years ago this is this is another example of this kind of leap of bridging the the two worlds shelly langdale when she was a uh, still curator at cleveland organized an exhibition dedicated to Paul wolo's Battle of the Ten Nudes, which is this large uh, 15th century Florentine engraving. And Cleveland has the first state, and all the other impressions of it in the world are a second state with reworking. And so they had an international conference in conjunction with the exhibition. And then she brought me in to do an engraving demonstration and they had me set up in the me- the medieval hall with the armor and the banners and all that. And I had about a hundred <laughs> art historians surrounding me and watching me. And they were saying, that's how it's done. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, yeah. And that was the Cleveland, th- there's a mystery with that engraving because there's this kind of return stroke. And mm. you know, it was a dry point, it was mixed and so forth. So I said, I'm going to figure this out actually by doing it. And they sent me a scan of the print, which I had transferred to copper plates here. And so then I 
uh, tried, not the whole plate, but, you know, different, the figures, the weapons and so forth to come to some conclusions again through my hand and eye about how the Battle of the Ten Mutes was done. What was the secret? Oh, well, I, I just thought it was, I mean, it's pure engraving. It was not, you know, yeah. that would, it was a mixed dry point thing. Oh, Recently, okay. I was in Florence. I had to go there for a bureaucratic errand a couple of weeks ago. And I went to the Bargello, which is, you know, the National Sculpture Museum in Florence. And for the first time, I saw the Mazzo Finiguera Niello's. You know, which in the Florentine telling of the history of engraving, that Mazo Finuguera invented engraving, uh, the Germans have a different origin story. Uh-huh. But these are silver plaques. You will see them reproduced in the history of you know history of prints books that were filled with uh, a kind of nickel amalgam. But they were passed during the mass. So when you exchange the handshake or the kiss of peace, this would be a way of, of, and it's called called Pax, P-A-X. And I was so moved to see them because it's one of those icons of art history that you know about, but to actually see them. I'd seen little Niello's at the British Museum, but just to see the ones that you actually study, it was pretty awesome. So. I I'm not I don't think I've ever seen those live and in person either. That must have been something. Mm-hmm. How did you manage to do all of this, <laughs> all of the things, Amy, and have kids and a husband and I mean I don't know how you did it. What can I say? <laughs> I did it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. So the kid like during Tom's sabbatical, the kids just you just moved everybody. Everybody went wherever oh, yes. Tom went. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. one child was born in Florence, Maria. We lived in London. We lived in Florence. We lived in Venice. I mean, we didn't have any family here, but my husband was fantastically supportive, really interested in what I was doing. And he was, I don't know, it's just that was that was our life. We did it. We would come and go and always look forward to so my children have been educated in, you know, in various, in English schools and Italian schools and, and so forth. Tom, I read in, in this fabulous catalog that the Iowa State University Museums made of your work, which seems to be super thorough, about his family, Tom's family's home burning in Little Rock. Oh my heavens, what, it's insane. And the images you made in, oh my gosh, they're ta- so haunting. Yeah, his parents were great. They were also really supportive and welcoming. And we were obviously, you know, kind of two different backgrounds very much so, but uh, they were very supportive of me and my work. And I had a very happy time there. Their house was a very modern house, but it was filled with family antiques. And then one day, because of apparently a Maybe a, the fire marshal said a lightning strike, but not at that moment, but that it, some, it was, they could tell from the way the wires were burned, um, that a short must have happened because of a previous lightning strike. Anyway, the whole house burned. It was just leveled. It was just turned to charcoal with practically everything in it. And books, paintings, you know, objects. I had been at in the 80s this is when this happened my work was very influenced by morandi at this point i was doing a lot with structure but also interested in cross hatching and just the these kind of dark images and i went to see the ruins of the house and even though it was horrible i couldn't believe how beautiful it was and so I started making drawings in the ruins of the house, actually using the burned hat, you know, using the charcoal as one of my drawing materials. And it was a destruction of a place that had been really important to me and, of course, you know, my family. And so that morphed into, I mean, over, over the next year or so, engravings of the the house destroyed by fire. And interestingly, that series became a favorite set of the whole family. 
even though it evoked oh. such pain. Wow. Huh. So then a year or so later, I'd, I'd just come back from a conference in Germany and I was just lying on the floor in jet lagged, you know, just falling asleep with jet lag. And the, when we got that news, uh, but th then the following year, there was a small plane crash on my street here in Des Moines. It was a, a group of runners from Iowa State University who were returning from a track meet. And there was an ice storm, November, late November, you know, how frozen mist. And they were diverted to the Des Moines airport from, they couldn't land in Ames. And two of the planes made it, and one of them it was obviously weighed down by ice and it actually crashed on my street. I saw the plane actually, I was setting the table for an early dinner. I saw the plane go down right in front and then it burst, you know, then there was this terrible noise and then silence. Well, it wasn't a bang, it was silence. And then it burst into flames. And my first impression was that it was a life flight helicopter because we have the helicopters that transport people to the hospital. That kind of made my way in the darkness. And I guess like many other people called 911. But seven people died in that plane crash about 300 feet from my house. And I felt that I needed to respond to that in my artwork in some way, but in a way that was not exploitive, exploitative. And how do you do that? And actually, a friend took me out to lunch to get me away the next day from the house because there was just this infinite line of cars coming down the street to see it. It was before they took the wreckage of the plane away. And she took me to a Chinese restaurant, and the kitchen door opened, and there were flames that were coming. And she said, I just blanched when I oh, saw I the fire. And, and I think for about a year, I could not stand to hear an airplane go overhead or, or see fire. Oh. Yeah. But I eventually figured out that I made a large engraving of, of this event, which is quite symbolic. It combined the wreckage of the plane, but with another drawing of our family's burned house. And then it was filled with Vanitas imagery because I had been working with Vanitas imagery in relation to the 17th century Dutch calligraphy that we talked about earlier, especially Jan Sanderdam's Vanitas, Vanitatum, the, the, um, that incredible Dutch Mannerist engraving. So that print is called House of Emblems and it's, it's packed full of meaning. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's 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 stunning, really. And of course, I have no sense of the scale in the book, which it's, is unfortunate. There's a it's, it's eighteen by twenty four. Right. I was like, oh my god, they're big. <laughs> yeah, they're big. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, so we should probably wrap it up, but I want to ask you: Are you going to retire ever? <laughs> <laughs> going to just keep making well, things, aren't you? Okay, so I have two more engraving commissions that are on deck, but I haven't started them. And then I am starting to work on writing a book about a 15th slash 16th century Venetian woman named Cassandra Fidele. She was a child genius and was the first woman to lecture at the University of Padua in 1487, first wow. woman to have first or second woman to have a, a contemporary woman to have a book in print in 1488. She's a really interesting figure. Um, women's studies people have discovered her. There, there are a couple of engravings of her. There was a missing Bellini portrait of her that's known through engravings. Oh. So I was first led to her through my ongoing study of illustrated books printed in Venice. I'm almost entirely away from art history here, but I've made important art, um, archival discoveries about her family and the strong women in her family. So my next year or two is going to be that. And then maybe I'll think about retiring. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when I find myself in the Archivio di Stato in, in Venice or you know, working on my graves, I feel 
I'm just in the right place. I feel good. Yeah, I, I feel that you have have lived a fairly charmed life <laughs> <laughs> and have used your incredible brain in so many different directions. Like, I just, I admire you so much. Well, thank you. Well, I'm surrounded also by a wonderful world of which you are you're a part in a great oh, artist, but wonderful curator, friends, historians. It's pretty magical. So thank you again for inviting me to be here. Oh, sure. And, and talk. I love their conversation. Oh, yeah. Come to Iowa. Come to Venice. Yeah. There you go. Oh, <laughs> I would like to come to Venice. <laughs> See? <laughs> Although I've never been to Des Moines and, and I hear really great things about it. So put that on my list too mm -hmm. do you I, yeah i feel like you are um the perfect example of having many fingers and many pieces and parts of the ecosystem and you are mm -hmm. an exemplar of why i always say the print people are the nicest people i have a lot of like-minded people isn't it so comfortable to just look at stuff together too right you know and <laughs> that is true it is so true yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Amy, I think we should sign off. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for coming on Plate Mark today. I, I so appreciate you uh, sharing all these wonderful stories with us. And, and I, I wish you the best with these commissions in your book. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of Plate Mark with my guest, Amy Worthen. She's a delight. I was so happy to talk to her and I can't wait to try and get to see her in Venice sometime. How am I going to make that work, people? <sighs> Well, thank you to Amy for being a wonderful guest. Thank you. And also my usual thank yous go to Dan Fury of Extension Audio for being my sound guy and to Michael Diamond for being our composer, <laughs> for letting us use his, his uh, compositions for the pod. Also a thank you to Skip Barnhart and Lee Turner for sending me soundscapes from their studios. Appreciate it, guys. And what else? I need to remind you also that the images Amy and I talk about are over on the show notes. And you know, you also can watch the YouTube version and the images will pop up as you watch us talk. So that's another way to do it. You can do it both ways. Woohoo! All right, I think that's it. We will see you next time.